It is my pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers, Tim Kelly, Product Manager at Assemble Systems, and Tom Schweitzer, Product Manager at iSquareFoot. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, thank you, Samira. Uh, what I'll do first is just briefly cover the agenda for today, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, we'll quickly introduce ourselves and our organizations, uh, as well as our guest speakers today. And then ultimately, we're going to step through um, a use case by Brassfield and Glory and what they're doing with the uh, integration between Assemble Systems and iSquareFoot, and, and ultimately sharing uh, uh, their benefits and, and lessons learned about a specific project they're working on. Uh, from there, we'll dig right into to Q and A. So. Uh, with that said, as Samira mentioned, um, my name is Tim Kelly, and um, the product manager here at Assemble. Uh, prior to joining Assemble, I was actually uh, part of a firm, a, a general contractor, and spent um, time in both pre-construction and in the field, um, focusing on BDC and BIM. Um, and, and through the course of that time, implemented and, and used a lot of different technology. Um, so, so that said, um, I want to go ahead and turn it over to our partner here, uh, Tom. I'm, I'm Tom Schweitzer, product manager here at iSquareFoot, a construction company. Been with the company for over 10 years, uh, working very closely with general contractors, uh, subcontractors, owners, and architects to kind of fill out uh, cutting edge uh, tools. And today, you know, is showing off one of those integrations with Assemble, uh, which we're really excited about. Um, and we have Chad and Contessa. Chad, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Chad Waters. Been with Brasco and Gorey for nine years. Half of which was in kind of the operations as a project manager, mostly in the healthcare market, and half of which has been in pre-construction. So I've been working um, hand in hand with our VDC department and team members like Contessa. Thanks, Chad. My name is Contessa Heider. I am a Senior Virtual Design and Construction Coordinator for Brasslin & Gorey. I've been working at Brasslin & Gorey for five years now, and I started as an estimator in the pre-construction department, and then from there um, trans transitioned on to the BDC coordinator role. As now that we have that out of the way, uh, what we ultimately want to do is just for those of you that aren't aware of uh, a symbol, I square foot or Brasslin & Gorey will quickly uh, share some information about our organization. So, uh, Assemble is a model data management system, cloud-based, and ultimately we allow you to uh, bring your model information into uh, a web environment where you can uh, dig in and use the flexibility of our system to uh, take the data you're getting out of the model and marry that up with other information uh, in a flexible way. And so once, uh, once you do that, you have the ability to then share that information out with the rest of your team and uh, leverage that capability to collaborate on the project. Uh, with one of those collaborations, uh, we're ultimately sharing information from Assemble into the I-square-foot environment. At I-square-foot, um, we primarily work around kind of the, the pre-bid, pre-construction side of things with, with bidding and estimating. Um, we have a host of uh, pre-qualification risk management tools as well that help uh, organize information about vendors within their directory. We also have the largest network of active subcontractors and suppliers in the industry to help supplement general contractors as they're uh, finding bidders and ultimately uh, getting better bids on bid day. Um, with that, uh, Chad, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Brassfield and Gorey? Sure. Um, Brasfield & Gorey is, um, has been in business for 53 years, since 1964, and is a privately owned construction company with 12 offices across the southeast. We do our work spread across around 14 market sectors, including sports and entertainment, where you'll see some of our higher profile jobs, such as the College Football Hall of Fame and the Georgia Aquarium. Uh, but we also have a, a robust healthcare resume in all of our offices, and um, we have chosen to speak to you today about one of those jobs as our case study. Um, in specifically in Atlanta, um, as it relates to pre-construction, um, to kind of give you an idea of what our capacities look like. Uh, so this is just the Atlanta office. We we have five chief and senior estimators and roughly 16 estimators. And really our, our process focuses on 
continued improvement through the, the collaboration with our in-house experts. And so those include our field staff, general superintendents, in-house MEP managers, and in-house scheduling. And of course, working um, side by side with our BDC department and Contessa's team. Thanks, Chad. And I'm going to talk a little further into how we work with the pre-construction and field teams in just a bit. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our VDC group. We are currently one of the fastest growing groups at BMG. We had about four people in the company five years ago, and now we're up to 22. We come from very different backgrounds, from construction management to mechanical engineering and even aerospace engineering. And we really believe that our variety and backgrounds help us bring fresh and diverse ideas to the collaboration for our group and other groups. Um, at v at v &G, our virtual design and construction team evaluates the best ways to allocate building information modeling resources to meet the needs of our clients and provide the most value. We use these resources coupled with our pre-construction team and b &G construction team's involvement to establish virtual representation of what is going to be physically built. Our group also does a lot of research and development on how to integrate new technologies into our daily work processes. Whether it is laser scanning, robotic layout, or drone flights, we strive to provide valuable and central content for our clients and our team. As Chad mentioned, we're going to showcase our Piedmont Hospital, but here are just a few examples to share with you all to understand what the BDC department's involvement may look like on any given job. Um, working with the pre-construction team is certainly one of our more common initial involvement. Um, this project that you're seeing is the Great Falls job that we had in Great Falls, Montana. It was a pursuit that we worked closely with the pre-construction team on because really all we were given was one floor plan, some pictures of the existing site, and a napkin with some sketches. So using our model and a symbol, we were able to generate model-based quantities for the estimating team and then created visual to help the client understand what was represented in our estimate. Another department we like to focus on is our self-perform group. Um, this is something we're very passionate about, and most of our self-perform uh, work is actually related to our concrete work. And from a VDC standpoint, we like to be involved in this process from the beginning in the pre-construction efforts all the way through the ASL information. The project you're seeing is Grandview. It was a medical office building, hospital renovation, and a parking deck combo where we modeled the concrete and filled our estimate from it using a symbol. We are not only generating quantities, but also using the model for visuals of PSI strength, as you can see in the left color-coordinated image. Um, we're also utilizing the models to understand lift and pore sequencing and to create drawings for that, understand and determine formwork systems discussing crew size analysis and constructability reviews. We really try to get our project managers, superintendents, and field engineers involved in this process as possible, early as possible. And that kind of moves us towards our field use of the model. We really want to make the VC involvement an all-encompassing process and ensure that our construction team gets the benefit of the technology. The job you're now seeing is the Florida Hospital Apopka replacement facility. We applied the model for this job in a self-performed um, way. And then we also utilize the model coupled with robotic layout to create more accurate layout and a better as-built information model for our owner. Contessa, that's uh, really awesome what your team's doing at Brass Food and Gory, collaborating with technology and ultimately making a better product for your owners. Um, and that's really the drive behind the assemble and I square foot integration, being able to take the models from the design firm, load them into assemble, to condition and organize the information and then create specific views of that information to attach to a project in I-square-foot that can then be accessed by the subs, uh, accessed by the subs right next to drawings and specs. So there's very minimal learning curve and, and what they're already familiar with with I-square-foot. Uh, and this really helps everyone better understand the scope of more time on the constructability of that project. So uh, what we do want to get into today is actually talking about the use case uh, at Piedmont. But um, what, I'll, what I'll do is, before we dive in and, and go through a demo, I, I just want to quickly talk about um, the benefits and both from the contractor side and, and the subcontractor side. Uh, starting as, as a general contractor, um, ultimately I, I actually was at a, a 
meeting this morning where we talked about the technology and, and things, how they're changing in our industry that allow for collaboration. And um, when we talk through this with uh, Chad and Contessa, what they're talking about is a collaborative process. And, and it's about communicating and, and working with their subcontractors and, and collecting all of that information and being able to uh, share across our team and report up as needed. So, so Chad, do you want to go ahead and step in here and start talking about what you guys have seen as benefits um, as you've gone through this process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we um, were able to, um, we were offered the opportunity to utilize the Assemble I Square Foot uh, integration at SD and DD rounds of pricing for Piedmont. And um, what we really saw was an increased level of insight from the subs and kind of a, a shorter learning cup curve from the subs that might have might be seeing the job for the first time. While internally our teams have been working on the job for six, eight months going through design, this might be the Mason's first time actually seeing the job. And so what the model was able to do um, through the uh, integration with I square foot is really shorten that learning curve and let him see the elevations, the brick elevations, um, you know, all the ins and outs of the job that might not be shown on a 2D drawing. Um, but what it also did was allow us to collaborate with them. So if they had a question, we could do a go-to meeting, share screens, and be looking at the same model. He had that uh, access and be able to uh, spin the model around, point exactly what elevations he had questions about. So it started started to open up that dialogue a lot more and, and really speed that process up. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really about a, a picture paints a thousand words, right? That's, you know, allowing them to dive in very quickly and understand what that, what that picture is. So, Chad, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Uh, to give you an example of exactly what I was talking about, um, so this is currently our DD structure model. and um, so we posted this when the DD documents went out and, you know, we've kind of made sure that we're getting the subcontractors on ramp and they understand how to view the models. We sent, sent out a few notifications and then we made sure while we were on the phone, we were walking them kind of to where this model was located and really showing them the ease of use in the model and how easy it was to really start digging into it. So, um, a really good example of one of the first things that we realized on, on how the model is being used was uh, we got a call from a, our one of our structural steel subcontractors that we had solicited and he was looking at the model and he said hey I, you know there's some steel that's shown in the model that you know we started putting our takeoff together and our proposal together that we don't really have capture that's not really shown in the drawings um, so for an example this is a, a an auditorium that uh, goes, you know, it is adjacent to the first floor, and so the elevation kind of dips down, and we have a second row of curtain wall supports um, that weren't shown in the 2D drawings. So we, we shared screens and started looking at, you know, what's shown in the 2D drawings, and so this is the, um, the framing plan for the first floor of that area at that elevation, and, you know, there's no steel shown at this, at this elevation. So we started kind of combing through the drawings and we made a list of eight or nine different locations of where, you know, very similar conditions were happening. And we were able to get some clarification from the structural engineer that, you know, yes, in fact, those were still members we need to include and just that section cut wasn't taken at the right elevation. It wasn't showing the elements below there. Um, so. But the great thing was it didn't slow us down. We kind of knew that, yes, there was going to be steel that needed to be there, and we actually already w were able to capture what size it was. And so all we were really waiting on was just confirmation from the structural engineer that, yeah, our, our assumptions were correct. Um, so that was one example of how the integration between I-square foot and assembly was really expediting and, and assisting us in the RFI process and vetting a design that's not done yet um, and really helping the designers fill in those gaps. Um, so secondly, what, uh, the other example that we had that really helped us was being able to 
filter out the objects in the model and share them specifically with certain subs. So this is an example um, that we used with the Masons. At DD, we didn't have partition type shown on the floor plans. So really, you can just, you kind of had to look at the hatching of the partitions, and they weren't exactly consistent um, on the 2D drawings. So what we wanted to do is, obviously, there's a big cost impact and a big cost difference between drywall partitions and CMU partitions, and it wasn't very clear on the 2D drawings. So we were able to go in and filter out just the CMU partitions in the parking deck and in the CEP and then share those with the mason to make sure that he's picking up all the locations he need, needed to. So we're able to both confirm quantity and understand exactly you know, where he's going to have to get to install these CMU partitions. So those are just two examples of how the model and being able to share those with the subs really helped us um, you know, dive a little bit deeper into the design, help fill in the gaps of um, that were left at a, at a DD yeah. level of um, design, and and truly reduce our our risk at this level of pricing. A absolutely, and I and I know uh, an argument uh, otherwise would be, well, the designer, this is so early, they would probably have caught that, and ultimately, uh, you you know, you're looking at a pricing set, and it's not there, and maybe you're making assumptions, but maybe not. And so being able to dig in this way and, and, and understand what's in the model and not in the plan set, uh, it sounds like that's really helping uh, across the team uh, provide a better quality in this pre-construction process. Absolutely. It was, um, and the more and more we use it, the, the better it gets. So the more subs that are um, digging into it, the more, you know, the, the more RFIs we got, the more things we caught that weren't exactly shown. Um, so it, it really starts to get exponential. Absolutely. That's great. And so um, kind of talking back to your points on, you know, from the subcontractor point of view, they're up to speed much faster, uh, even if they're jumping in later. Uh, this helps them get on the same page as the rest of the team. Um, you're digging into phasing and complexity there and you're isolating some packages that, um, you know, maybe when you're just looking at drawings, you've got all the, the stuff shown on your page, but you're able to sit down with Mason and isolate a, you know, some scope of work and, and then share that with them without any, any um, you know, heavy software that you're, you're inviting them to this and they actually are able to see it very quickly. That's, that's fantastic. Absolutely. So, um, are there any other things that you notice that uh, as you do this, I, I think we talked before about um, in the RFI process and bidding or, or working with the subcontractors, you're starting to clear things up um, more early or avoid any rework. Can you, can you talk a little bit more to that? Um, yeah, so I, I think probably one of the good examples of that would be a, a lot of what Contessa was working on um, getting a really deep dive into our self perform um, and what we were doing internally using assemble and I square foot. So I mean the kind of examples I was giving you was externally to our subs in which we're going out to where we would be going out to three or four subcontractors for um, each trade as a minimum and then kind of roping them into the collaborative process. But we also we also kind of have a parallel track that we're working on internally um, that we're really taking a, a much deeper dive into the structure and trying to work out some of those nuances in the structure as early as possible. So I think she can probably speak to that a lot better. Absolutely. I'll go ahead and, uh, Contessa, make you presenter so you can share your screen. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I just wanted to review how we use Assemble for self-reform and internally, like Chad was saying, um, as well as some subcontractor communication, how we utilize it to eliminate rework, and then also how it's helping us with the RFI process. As I was saying, the um, this project was very special case because really we haven't used A360 a ton, but this job we were able to utilize A360 with Autodesk. And that's a platform that allows us to be sharing our central model with the design teams. And the design teams are also sharing their models with us. And those models are live all the time. And, you know, their sharing with us has been so helpful in the self-reform process and the pre-construction process and 
we were really on a good track to have this collaboration. And then from there, just to understand how we use the models for the self-perform sector of, of b and is the first thing we really like to do is start to understand the constructability of the job and really start to learn the job. And I'm, I'm sure you can see there's a ton of views on this job. Um, really what we try to start with are some of the families. So, you know, separating the beams out, separating the columns out, really start to understand uh, the, the scope of work that we're about to be self-performing. Um, and then from there, we start to look at it by level um, and look at those crew analysis, look at the formwork analysis, and really start to talk about the lift and pour sequences that I was mentioning earlier. And, um, and then... Can I jump in uh, really quick uh, before you jump into of course. What I want to clarify is, is, is Contessa here is talking about use and assemble. And, and what that really means is this is a set of data. It's not just a camera snapshot, but, but rather they've broken this down so they have specific sets of data that they're looking at. So when they go into those core sequences, it's got the, the associated uh, items or objects that are just part of that particular level or that sequence. Exactly, yes. And, and I can go into that just a little bit more here in a second, but um, from a general standpoint, this is our view of a Piedmont Hospital overall. And as Chad was saying, one of the best things to do with the models, especially at an early design phase, is just start to look at it and move it around and understand what's in the drawings and what's missing. And so for this job, for example, um, our two low roofs here, there weren't really a lot of cut sections in, the, in this um, area of the building on the drawings. And so instead of having to immediately rush and ask for more cut sections, we're able to look at the model and really capture how this is going to be built with our field team. And, you know, from there we can share that information with our subcontractors during our scope um, and then with our pre-construction teams for pricing. And another area, uh, the beams on our MEP level are crazy, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, we were able to look at the model with our superintendent, and he even put on virtual reality headsets and looked and walked through his job so he could better inform us on how it's going to be built. And then once we kind of do a, a general overall constructability review and overall review of the entire model, that's when we start to break it down um, like we were just discussing into different formats and different sections of the building. So again, the beams or the foundation work. And from there, once we have the views set up that are helpful for us, we really start to sc scrub the model and scrub with the drawings. And, and what I mean by that is we are physically opening the 2D drawing set, clicking on a foundation in a symbol, coming to see what size it is labeled as, coming to see what the length and width and thickness of that footing is and then double checking it against the footing schedule and the drawings and double checking that the location of that footing is also labeled as an S5 footing. And this really helps make sure that we are generating quantities that are correct and that we, this is how we really start to catch the RFIs that we have through the model. And so moving more towards that, um, the, this was a view that we created of items that we were finding were actually more detailed in the model or maybe they didn't even show up in, in the drawing set. And so that was something we definitely wanted to sit down with our pre-construction team to look at and see you know, what we need to price, what do we need to be considering, and again, how does that affect our formwork or our crew analysis. And so as we started to filter down and understand the job, this is another view of those same walls of walls we just could not figure out what was going on. And so from there, um, this is how we start to generate a model RFI log. And this is an example of one of the model logs that we have. And we're associating a view and a symbol with the question so that we can go through these with the engineer on a call and understand what these walls are. Um, another example was um, one of the mat foundation slabs that we had on the job. So this, from a 2D standpoint, these foundation slabs looked to be about the same, um, and they were all noted, only one was noted actually, and it was a 12-inch foundation. 
So upon opening the model, we were able to look and see that there's actually three sizes, and especially this one is a 48-inch foundation slab. So really starting to get that kind of information early on, especially like our SD round or DD round, really helps us understand and make sure that our estimate is complete. Um, I think that's a, about all that I have to share with you on the, how we catch discrepancies and create the RFI logs for now. That, that makes a lot of sense, Contessa. And it sounds like um, as you kind of talk through the, the last part there is that you're, you're working on managing your risk. Um, and at the end of the day, you're responsible to build what's in the contract documents. And, um, so I, I think we're going to talk about lessons learned here and talk through that process. But what, what I was hearing you say is that you're using the model because of the benefit there um, in both the visuals and the data that you get but your team is going through a process of making sure that the data that's there in the model is, is uh, complete and accurate. And then you're also looking at the model and making sure that the data that you see on your design documents are complete and accurate. And so you're using uh, you know, multiple um, eyes on a project to, to complete and, and uh, organize the information that's needed. Exactly. Yeah, there's a, a ton of cross-lateral representation there. I mean, we have to keep going from drawings to model, model to drawings, and really see, you know, what shakes out as information that's not clear and get clarification on that. And really, I mean, when you get visuals like this, it's easy for you and the design team to have those discussions um, and really to keep track of, of what the discrepancies are. Awesome, Contessa, what you guys are doing and how you're really making this this going. And, and here, here's a slide here that just kind of highlights some of the lessons that uh, you guys have learned throughout the process and just kind of brings a couple questions to mind. And maybe this first one's a little more for Chad. You know, um, you, you mentioned before, you know, getting subs involved and kind of kind of bringing them to the to the technology. How, how receptive were your subs uh, taking to this approach? Were there specific trades that were uh, more amenable to, to this workflow or this process than others? And maybe expound on that a little bit. Yeah, there definitely were. I, I think that um, if if each trade or a specific sub had previous um, had previous experience with models, they were a lot quicker to say, oh, there's there's model views available, let me dig into this. Um, whereas we, we had a couple masons that just weren't familiar with, you know, they had heard 3D modeling, but it just they just haven't had to deal with it or haven't dealt with it before. So it was just kind of new to them. So um, they were a little bit uh, resistant to change and resistant to the new technology, but uh, what's great about it is it's so intuitive the way, you know, the assemble viewer is set up. It's liter literally right underneath the documents. There's model views. They clicked on the exterior models or when I created the CMU partitions only, um, they were able to click on that model view. And I mean, if, you know, you're able to operate a mouse, you're able to interact with the model. And that's really all it took. So. Once I showed them the information they can gain from accessing those model views, um, it really took off from there. So I would say some of those resistant subs, yeah, you kind of had to lead them to water, but once you did, um, man, it, 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 we started getting a lot of questions and a lot more interaction. Um, it was really astonishing when we started getting it because you could really tell the guys that were really looking at it because um, all of a sudden your email and phone would be blowing up with questions and uh, wanting more information, and they they really started, um, you know, collaborating with us. That's really cool. Uh, le leading into kind of communication, I think you guys shared shared with me uh, in some conversations before a little bit. You know, um, you guys really learned. You know, communication was key in this, right? And and as you were getting doc, um, you know, updated models regularly. Um, being able to communicate that in, in a good format. Contessa, could you tell us a little bit about the challenges that you guys had with making sure the subs understood what was in the model and, and kind of how those updates kind of flowed back downstream from your, from your perspective? Sure, yeah. Um, like you were saying, we get so much information with this continual sharing and it's amazing, but you definitely have to organize it and communicate your sharing as you go. So for example, um, an exterior architectural model and an interior architectural model. 
both of them included some drywall aspects. So when we uploaded those to Symbol for our teams to look at, it's very important to make sure to communicate that there are scopes, of, you know, there's scope in both of those models. And, um, you know, that also takes you back to scrubbing the models and understanding what's in them. So I think making sure you scrub your models, understand what's there, and then communicate with your teams what views are available and what is actually in each view is key to success on this. Yeah, and I, I would just echo that as it just, you know, it just takes a really good strategy up front on how you're going to manage the model posting and then um, a, a good plan on how you're going to, you know, execute that, that strategy and um, you just got to follow through. So yes, there's a lot of new information and it's a change from what we were used to seeing with just, you know, the DD documents and then any subsequent addendums. It is, um, it's a different workflow than that, but I, in and it's a lot more collaborative, and uh, it yielded better results. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll weigh in on that, just to, in, that, in that kind of talking through, setting up that process. I think in any of this, the collaboration um, that you're talking through uh, requires a, a process that's fit to, to your market, to your project type, to your team. And sitting down and discussing that with, uh, with your designers, your, your subcontractors, your owner, whatever it means, uh, sitting down and having those discussions and establishing that process up front it is key to this, this, any of this working well. That's great. Um, Tom, was there anything else you wanted to weigh in on, lessons learned there? I think that was uh, a good high level. I mean, we could probably talk all day on this, but, you know, really want to be sensitive to everybody's time. And we really want to... Give a strong thank you to, to Chad and Contessa for, for sharing their wisdom and what they've learned here. Um, and sounds like, you know, a big, big point on this is, you know, as we're bringing on more subs and, and more teams to collaborate on this, uh, the, the learning curve, you know, there's a little bit, but it's not much. And once you're past that initial resistance, it everybody immediately sees the benefit and the impact that it has on, on the job. So we're really happy that you guys were able to share your, uh, your insights with us today.